Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to the 2020 C.S. Lewis Virtual Summit. This is a joint production of the C.S. Lewis Foundation and the C.S. Lewis College. The theme of this summit is Deeper Magic, C.S. Lewis, and the Serious Business of Heaven. We take our inspiration from two Lewis sources. The first is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where the phrase deeper magic comes in. This is in reference to the deeper magic of Narnia from before the very creation of the world that says, when a willing victim who has committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. The second inspiration is from Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, where Lewis writes, it is only in our hours off only in our moments of permitted festivity that we find an analogy to the joys of heaven. But in this world, everything is upside down. That which, if it could be prolonged here, would be a truancy, is like us that which in a better country is the end of ends. Joy is the serious business of heaven. So in a world full of uncertainties, fears and distractions, we hope to point toward both the gravity of the cross and also the lightness of the joy of his kingdom. And so welcome this evening to our first evening of our virtual summit in 2020. I'm Amber Saladin. I work with the C.S. Lewis Foundation and have been with the foundation since my teenage years. So a long, long time. And in 2020, we realized that virtually was a great way to be together um, and this is not the way that we like to meet together. We prefer to be together in the same room, enjoying tea and biscuits and company and laughter and joy. Uh, but this virtual technology allows us to continue to inspire one another, to meet together, to fill our minds with those things uh, which we want to fill our minds with beyond the news, beyond social media and all the things happening in our lives. This time, this next hour is dedicated toward something better. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank all of our volunteers and donors who have made this webinar possible. Your generosity helps us live the legacy of C.S. Lewis and to spotlight the work of others who are doing the same. I'd specifically like to thank our virtual summit sponsors, Preservation of Elegance, Dr. and Mrs. J. Wesley Vick III, Kevin and Marianne Dibley, and Joshua George. Now, one of our values um, with the C.S. Lewis Foundation, uh, we have many values. One of them is opening with prayer, and I will do that um, now. And in order to do that, I have a special prayer I'd like to read this evening from um, the Book of Common Prayer that will help set our minds and hearts on this evening. This is a prayer of self-dedication written by William Temple. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and to the welfare of your people through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now this evening we come to our um, we come to our guest this evening, Karen Swallow Pryor, who will be speaking to us on C.S. Lewis and some of his early poetry. As I introduce Karen, you are welcome to join me on the screen, Karen. Karen Swallow Pryor is hello. <laughs> is a research professor of English and Christianity and culture at Southeastern Baptist Theological College, uh, Theological Seminary. This is a new uh, appointment for you. Yes, Karen? Yes, it is. Brand new. <laughs> Brand new. She's the author of Booked, Literature in the Soul of Me, Fierce Convictions, The Extraordinary Life of Hannah Moore, and um, the book that I have, On Reading Well, Finding the Good Life Through Great Books. And she's also the co-editor of Cultural Engagement, A Crash Course in Contemporary Issues. Her writing has appeared in Christianity Today, 
The Atlantic, The Washington Post, First Things, Relevant, and many, many other places. Karen gives frequent lectures and talks about her work, including University of Minnesota, Northwestern University, Wheaton College, and a lot of other, a lot of other institutions. Karen completed her PhD at the State University of New York in Buffalo and her undergraduate in Amherst. Her academic focus is British literature with a specialty in the 18th century. I love this part, Karen. A period she loves for its emphasis on philosophy, ethics, aesthetics, and community, as well as its efforts to correcting the universal human impulse to gravitate toward extremes. Karen is a founding member of the Pelican Project, a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum, a senior fellow of the International Alliance for Christian Education, a senior fellow at the L. Russ Bush Center for Faith and Culture, and is a member of the Faith Advisory Council of the Humane Society of the United States. She and her husband live on a hundred year old homestead in central Virginia with various and sundry horses, dogs, and chickens. And uh, two of these dogs are very special to you. Is that right, Karen? Uh, yes, and anyone who follows me on social media uh, is surely acquainted with Ruby and Eva. <laughs> They're very cute. I was watching videos of them today. <laughs> it's Karen, hard we're to delighted. I'm done with them around. <laughs> <laughs> we're delighted to have you with us tonight, Karen. What are you going to be speaking on? Well, I'm going to be um, giving a talk drawn from uh, a foreword that I wrote for a new edition of C.S. Lewis's um, poems written early in his life before he was a believer. Um, and so I'm excited to share that with you. And actually, I'll, I'll read some of his poetry from this collection as well. Wonderful. We're delighted. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I also wanted to say I'm so excited about um, opening with the hymn from John Newton because um, he was a, a dear friend of Hannah Moore, um, whose, uh, uh, whose biography I wrote about in, in one of my books. So it was a special time period to me. And of course, you know, C.S. Lewis was influenced by that earlier generations of, of, of Christians in his country. Um, and of course, we all know that Lewis was a great uh, Christian thinker and writer. That's what drew us here. Um, but it's really fascinating um, to witness the growth of a thinker and writer like Lewis over time. Um, it's even more fascinating, especially if we are believers, to witness a thinker and writer moving from unbelief to belief and then to mature faith. Um, in my area of study, there are a few writers like this. Um, for example, um, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Mary Shelley, uh, and T.S. Eliot are just a couple who, over the course of their lives, either converted or just grew uh, more orthodox in their faith, and it's a joy to witness that. Um, and But I think Lewis is probably one of the most dramatic examples of this because he um, went from you know, pretty um, pretty serious atheism um, to belief and then, then Christian faith, and within his body of works, we are actually able to witness that kind of trans transformation as it takes place um, in his works. And so when he published his very first work as a young man, uh, Lewis was just 20 years old and he was a, a committed atheist. Um, and this work, as I mentioned, is titled um, Spirits in Bondage, is a collection of poetry published in 1919 under the pseudonym Clive Hamilton. Um, so that consists of his first name and then his deceased mother's maiden name. Um, and, you know, he had not yet converted to the Christian faith, although like most people of his time and place, he kind of grew up in a, in a Christian culture, at least a nominally Christian culture. Um, but because he was not a believer, reading these poems is, uh, is really kind of a, an adventure into his mind as they provide very intriguing insights into the artist as a young man, a young man who would become, as we know, one of the most read, most read and revered of modern Christian writers. Um, and of course, all art reflects something of the artist, but because of poetry's compressed and intense and expressive use of language, I think it's a form that um, is uh, just re tends to reveal much more of the writer's heart and soul in general, and that's no exception here. 
And, you know, in truth, this collection is youthful in every sense. Um, some of you may be um, Lewis lovers and aficionados, but yet I know a lot of people actually have not read this collection of poetry. I had not read it before I was asked to write about it. I hadn't even heard of it. Um, some of you perhaps have, but it is, you know, it is a work that uh, is written by a 20 year old, although a very advanced and intellectual and skilled 20 year old. Um, so in some ways it is both a work of immaturity and a work of promise. And that's what's fun about reading it. Um, I mean, to anyone who's familiar with his later prose, which I'm sure everyone here is, um, this volume of poems is to the reader um, both familiar and strange. Um, it's familiar because some of its pages are filled with the fairies and the satires and talking animals that we all know and love in Lewis. And yet strange because, um, because there's so much unbelief and despair and even bitterness that pervades so many of the poems. Um, and of course, these dark qualities are not surprising because they reflect not only um, his atheism, um, but as I'll talk about in a minute, you know, his, his fresh experiences off of the battlefront. Um, but it was this time in his life that he recounts later in Surprise by Joy, um, where, um, you know, that he talks about being raised in this Christian context, um, embracing atheism as a teen, um, eventually learning, to, returning to theism, and then eventually, you know, um, Orthodox Christian faith through the influence of his dear friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, but this is a book that was written in that first phase that he recounts in that book. Um, so reading these poems in retrospect, um, it is actually hard not to see in them that deep longing for transcendence, um, despite the poem's repeated declarations of unbelief. Um, this is actually the time of life that, again, in Surprised by Joy, Lewis says, and this is a, a quote from that work, I was at this time, meaning this time when he was writing these, living like so many atheists or anti-theists in a world of contradictions. I maintained that God did not exist, and I was also very angry with God for not existing. I was equally angry with him for creating a world. That's the voice of Lewis that comes through in these poems. Uh, and so that kind of dark mood that prevails is not surprising given um, that disbelief, but also because many of the poems were written um, or revised during the time that Lewis spent in the trenches of World War I in France and during his recovery from injuries that he gained there. Um, in fact, the last poem in the collection called Death in Battle um, he intended to serve as his farewell if he didn't survive the war. So here he was an atheist, um, was afraid that he was going to die from these injuries and wrote this poem. Um, and I'm going to read that to you. Um, it's the very last one. Death in Battle. Open the gates for me. Open the gates of the peaceful castle, rosy in the west, in the sweet dim isle of apples over the wide sea's breast. Open the gates for me. Sorely pressed have I been and driven and hurt beyond bearing this summer day. But the heat and the pain together suddenly fall away. All's cool and green. But a moment agone, among men cursing in fight and toiling, blinded I fought. But the labor passed on a sudden, even as a passing thought, and now alone. Ah, uh, to be ever alone in flowery valleys among the mountains and silent wastes untrod, in the dewy upland places, in the garden of God, this would atone. I shall not see the brutal crowded faces around me that in their toil have grown into the faces of devils. Yea, even as my own, when I find thee, when I find thee, O country of dreams, beyond the tide of the ocean, hidden and sunk away out of the sound of battles, near to the end of day, full of dim woods and streams. It's not hard to imagine this young man on, wounded on the battlefield, surrounded by these violent faces of war um, and 
fearing death yet hoping for some eternal release and notice that he puts imagines that place is one of woods and streams um so another aspect of of these poems is because after the war lewis did return to college where he was a budding young scholar and he was greatly influenced by the poets that he read and poetry like all literature and all art is always produced in conversation with other poets writers and thinkers um, and also in conversation with the spirits of one of one's age and so Lewis's verses reflect this diverse range of literary and intellectual sources that he was exposed to and immersed in. And the time that he lived in, um, not surprisingly, was one um, that was characterized by um, materialism and the in the philosophical sense, pessimism and unbelief. So that's the general mood of the age of the, the uh, the end of the 19th century uh, in the early 20th century. And also we see in his poems echoes of later Victorian poets who were also known for their doubt, skepticism and despair. Poets like Matthew Arnold and Thomas Hardy, um, their spirits and moods and attitudes reverberate through many of the poems in this collection, um, contending with an evil God um, and the vanity of any attempt to believe in a just God that cares for earthly pain. So this heavy influence by these earlier poems is seen not only in these ideas, but even in the form of many of the poems. And this is a very experimental um, collection of poetry um, using a lot of a variety of forms. But many of the forms that, that Lewis drew on um, were sort of a quaint styles that were already outdated um, when he was writing them and when they were published. Um, again, this is partly why I titled this talk uh, The, uh, the po Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Um, he's sort of channeling some older, outdated forms of poetry. And that's probably why uh, most critics think that the reception of these poems when they came out was rather cool, uh, not a very warm reception. And that may also be why Lewis eventually turned um, from writing poetry, although he did write some, continued to write some poems in his life, but we know he turned to prose, both fiction and nonfiction, and that would become his legacy. Um, so it was a fortunate turn. Um, so despite the derivative quality of some of these poems, um, Lewis actually fortunately chose his influences well. Um, he, you know, he studied good voices, important voices, and chief among these is John Milton. Um, and it's actually a, a phrase in John Milton's Paradise Lost that provides the title phrase of the collection Spirits in Bondage um, from a passage that appears in a speech by Satan um, in book one uh, in a famous scene when he uh, Satan is expelled from heaven uh, and wakes up having been thrown into hell and he's rousing his legion of uh, uh, fellow fallen angels and he declares this infernal pit shall never hold celestial spirits in bondage. And so that is the title. Um, and um, it's interesting because uh, many of the romantic poets in the uh, early 19th century considered Satan to be the hero of Paradise Lost for, for many reasons. Um, and of course that was not what Milton intended. And, uh, and Lewis actually sort of adopts that posture by having Satan speak um, in this poem. But interestingly enough, we know that when Lewis became a Christian, um, he adopted that topic in um, uh, the screw tape letters, but of course, you know, using the voice of, of Satan and the demons um, to, to teach uh, good Christian doctrine, not to undermine it. And so I thought that I would read um, the poem that opens the collection, uh, which is called Satan Speaks. Um, and it's again, a, a little bit pessimistic here. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, I am nature, the mighty mother. I am the law, ye have none other. I am the flower and the dew drop fresh. I am the lust in your itching flesh. I am the battle's filth and strain. I am the widow's empty pain. I am the sea to smother your breath. I am the bomb, the falling death. 
I am the fact and the crushing reason to thwart your fantasy's newborn treason. I am the spider making her net. I am the beast with jaws blood wet. I am a wolf that follows the sun and I will catch him ere day be done. Um, rather a dark poem. And we see, uh, you know, a lot of this dualism throughout the works. Um, Lewis was a romantic um, before and after becoming a Christian. That He had that, that kind of idealism of, you know, uh, physical and spiritual as, as separate categories. Um, but he even talks about, he has a, a bit of Gnosticism here before he's a Christian. He even wrote a letter to his friend, um, Arthur Greaves, explaining that in, in this collection of poetry, matter equals nature, which equals Satan. Um, and so that is the, the idea that he's setting forth in this opening poem. And throughout the whole collection, it's not surprising to see a lot of these dualistic tensions throughout the material versus the spiritual, animal nature versus versus the divine nature, nature versus God, or, you know, the, the lower G gods, the rational mind or reason versus the imagination, the ordinary versus the extraordinary, and hopelessness versus um, the hope that actually is implicit in all longing. There's just a lot of these, um, you can see, see Lewis sort of battling back and forth between these dualities and, uh, and, and not being able to synthesize them in the way that um, really, I think we only can as believers. Um, so there's actually the, the, the famous um, uh, Lewis scholar, Don King's King refers to the voice in these poems as a frustrated dualist who's moored uh, to the material world, yet see seeking to escape it. And that follows the pattern of the three parts um, in the poem because he, in the collection, he divided them into um, sections. Uh, the first section being the prison house, the second part hesitation, and the third part escape. And I think that theme um, really reminds us of, again, one of Lewis's most famous lines in Mere Christianity, where he said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Um, and so it's just so fascinating that the last section of these uh, of this collection is titled The Escape. Um, so I want to... Uh, read a couple more poems. Um, I think that the, I think the best poem in this collection is uh, one of the early ones. And again, it is one that describes his experience in um, World War I. It's called French Nocturne. And then I, after I read that, I'm actually, uh, these poems are dark, but I also like darker literature. So I, in my selection, I, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm picking <laughs> some of those. Uh, but then when I, after I read this one, I want to read another one that I think um, is very delightful and, and foreshadows the Lewis um, who came to love God and God's people. So um, this is, uh, again, this is, this is a scene uh, that he witnesses. He's just describing uh, in this poem, the scene of war that he um, was part of. Long leagues on either hand, the trenches spread and all is still. Now even this gross line drinks in the frosty silences divine. The pale green moon is riding overhead. The jaws of a sacked village, stark and grim, out on the ridge have swallowed up the sun. And in one angry streak, his blood has run to left and right along the horizon dim. There comes a buzzing plane. And now it seems flies straight into the moon. Lo, where he steers across the pallid globe and surely nears in that white land some harbor of dear dreams. False mocking fancy. Once I too could dream, who now can only see with vulgar eye that he's no nearer to the moon than I, and she's a stone that catches the sun's beam. What call have I to dream of anything? I am a wolf back to the world again, and speech of fellow brutes that once were men, our throats can bark for slaughter, cannot sing. Very, very powerful experience um, of being in war. 
But uh, there are, as I said before, there are, there's a lot of fantasy here, a lot of creatures, a lot of animals speaking. Um, and then this just really delightful poem. Um, I'm going to read the whole thing and then I know my time is up. So I'll close with this poem and I cannot wait to hear your questions. This poem is called In Praise of Solid People. Thank God that there are solid folk who water flowers and roll the lawn and sit and sew and talk and smoke and snore all through the summer dawn, who pass untroubled nights and days full fed and sleepily content rejoicing in each other's praise, respectable and innocent, who feel the things that all men feel and think in well-worn grooves of thought, whose honest spirits never reel before man's mystery overwrought, yet not unfaithful nor unkind, with workday virtues surely stayed, theirs is the sane and humble mind and dull affect affections undismayed. Oh, happy people, I have seen no verse yet written in your praise, and truth to tell, the time has been I would have scorned your easy ways. But now, through weariness and strife, I learn your worthiness indeed. The world is better for such life as stout suburban people lead. Too often have I sat alone when the wet night falls heavily, and fretting winds around me moan, and homeless longing vexes me. For lore that I shall never know and visions none can hope to see till brooding works upon me so that a childish fear steals over me. I look around the empty room, the clock still ticking in its place and all out silent is the tomb till suddenly I think a face grows from the darkness just beside. I turn and lo, it fades away and soon another phantom tide of shifting dreams begins to play and dusky galleys past me sail, full freighted on a fairy sea. I hear the silken merchants hail across the ringing waves to me. And suddenly, again, the room, familiar books about me piled, and I alone amid the gloom by one more mocking dream beguiled. And still, no nearer to the light, and still no further from myself, alone and lost in clinging night, the clock still ticking on the shelf, then do I envy solid folk who sit of evenings by the fire after their work and doze and smoke and are not fretted by desire. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I wish you could hear us clapping for you right now. <laughs> what a beautiful poem that, I mean, all of them were striking in many ways. Doesn't that last one remind you of Hobbits? It does, yes. <laughs> I wanted to remind our people too, this uh, Lewis in World War I is not something that we often talk about, but we have a Lewis Foundation friend called Professor Joe LaConte, who wrote a book called A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and A Great War, which talked about Lewis and Tolkien's experiences in World War I and how that affected their writing. So if you at home are interested in doing a little bit more work on that, um, that is a really good book to jump into. But here we have Karen with us. So Karen, that, um, it's so interesting to hear uh, these poems. And I loved the, how you set them up as, you know, we all know Lewis as a mature man. And here he is in his, just out of his teens almost, um, writing um, writing some really fascinating, um, kind of writing his way through uh, working things out. Is he really an atheist? Except that he's writing about um, escape um, and moving into uh, what, what will that be? I want to write, uh, before I ask you some questions, I want to remind folks that there is the Q&A button, which you can um, write in um, to answer or to ask questions. Um, there's also the chat button too, that's sort of more of a chat function. The Q&A one I will be looking at for questions for Karen. So Karen, uh, Lewis was both a scholar, an academic um, man and also a writer for lay audiences. So he was able to um, bridge those, those worlds, which is something we really value. Um, what are some unique and opportunities and challenges that came with that role for him and, and for you as well as a scholar 
um, and a lay writer. Yeah, I mean, I in, in um, the research that I've done, and again, I'm not a Lewis scholar, I became one to write this, but, um, and of course, I teach some of his, uh, a few of his works in different courses, but um, he, you know, he actually met with a lot of resistance and skepticism among his peers in academia, he was teaching, you know, not in a, you know, not in a I guess not even in a nominally Christian institution, um, and so he faced some some of that opposition, and yet he held his own. Um, and he, you know, he. I think even a lot of people who read his fiction don't know. I mean, I would consider I, you know, I'm maybe a little bit biased, but I consider some of his greatest contributions to be the literary ones, like his preface mm-hmm. to Paradise Lost and his um, his uh, writings on the Middle Ages and um, and and medieval literature. And so that's really how I knew him. And so he was a respected scholar in that area, but of course he was writing these other works for fellow believers. And even at that stage, you know, in the early 20th century, by then modernism had um, hit its full stride and being a devout Christian was not a popular thing, especially among academics. So I take some solace in that and in an example. Um, And so he was really, he was kind of uh, balancing a tough line there. Um, And uh, I think even, you know, I mean, we know that there are, he and Tolkien were great friends, but I think even Tolkien sometimes, sometimes, um, you know, maybe disdained some of his more popular writings or that approach. So um, it's a unique place to be in. And um, it's similar to, I think, where I find myself in. And, uh, it's, it's hard to be an academic and a Christian and, and reach that wide audience. And so um, I'm sensitive to that, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we want to encourage you as best we can <laughs> in, in your work and in, in what you're doing in your life. We've, we've got a great question here from Carmen who asks, did Lewis ever revisit these pre-grace poems as a believer and comment on them? Hmm. You know, I don't, I, I have not come across anything that he did. I don't, I, I almost, and again, I don't know for sure, but I don't believe so. I think in some ways this book is like that, uh, embarrassing first. <laughs> I don't think it's embarrassing, but you know, there, there are some people out there who will say, who talk about, and I, actually this is the advice I give, like, don't, if you're a young aspiring writer, don't, aspire to publish something when you're very young because um because you might come to regret that and I don't know that he did but I would tend more that way I don't know Uh, and of course again the best evidence we have is that he he turned to literary criticism and prose and then eventually fiction um so uh because you know he these weren't critically received that well but of course it's I think that I think it's a rich um uh, text that we have because it shows us something about Lewis. Um, but again, you know, beware, don't publish when you're 20 years old. I mean, Lewis can get away with it because he had that much talent and skill, um, but 20 right. was, so I don't know of any commentary that he has on these poems, but there could be some out there. Right, right. That's helpful. That's, that's wise advice for the 20 year olds among us. Just <laughs> keep writing, just keep writing, keep it to yourself for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just saw a question I thought would be, um, great to ask you and, oh, yes. Lovely. Rudini. That's a great name. Rudini. Um, Rudini says it's interesting. Even as a non-believer, Lewis was talking about solid people Mm. in the great divorce. He refers to the solid people as the bright spirits, which is interesting. Where do you suppose he got this idea or metaphor of solid people? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, in, uh, you know, my area of expertise is like 18th and 19th century, not much into the 20th century. Um, but it does seem like that phrase, I mean, it's still a phrase that we have, um, maybe today, like solid, solid people, you know, good people, um, you know, somebody ought to do an engram search for, <laughs> for that phrase. Uh, it's not one I'm familiar with. I don't know if it's, I imagine it was one that was probably kind of circulating in the air. Um, and maybe we just don't use as much now, but um, yeah. it, that, you know, this was the time period, the late, uh, really more the early 20th century with the onset of mar- modernism and, you know, in the literary oh. and artistic movement where people 
uh, there was the, the, the division, the hard division between high art and low art, mm. high culture and low culture. Um, that was very characteristic of this age. So I, so, you know, the kind of division that we feel like we have now between, you know, um, I don't didn't even know what categories to use, but, but, you know, the, the elites and those who resent the elites, whatever words we want to use. Um, this is actually, that was something that was very characteristic of this time period of the high and the low. So, um, so that idea was circulating in that phrase. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to look it up after this. <laughs> Great. Always a learner, always a learner. Um, there's a question here from Claude about venting versus earnest questioning. Um, these are often pro-offered as a prerequisite for coming to faith. Are these poems evidence of his venting or of sincere, think, sincere seeking? Did they prep him in any way for his later conversion? Mm. I read these poems as sincere seeking. Um, and that's an excellent question. Um, I actually just last week uh, was teaching, um, teaching a British literature survey and we, uh, I was teaching T.S. Eliot's uh, The Wasteland. And that's another example of a poem that was written just a few years before Eliot's conversion. And it's so hard not to read that poem and see, despite that pessimism and that despair and the expression of fragmentation, there's real seeking there. And I see in these poems, real seeking. And I'm not sure, you know, uh, and maybe other scholars have, have looked at this, but, um, you know, it, I'm not sure how ingrained Lewis's atheism was. I mean, not to diminish, you know, not to, to diminish it. Um, but you know, young people go through stages of, of questioning, um, and doubt and well, and older people too. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I think that's something that, um, if we encouraged more in a healthy way, this, this, the earnest asking as opposed to the venting, then, then maybe fewer people would, feel like they must be atheists, yeah. if that makes sense. If we, if we incorporate, folded into our understanding of what it means to be a sincere believer, the ability to, and the need to question and doubt, then, then maybe some of the question and doubters would realize that they're just asking questions, not that they don't believe. That's really profound. As a parent and as a teacher, I want to take that to heart. How can I encourage earnest and honest questioning among, and, and in myself too, among the people in my life? And there's, and there's nothing wrong with a good vent either now and then. You know, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, Karen, why do Christian writers often get categorized as Christian? Mm. You know, it's, as we look at how Lewis is received, um, in the world, it's, it's interesting to see how some people view, uh, just put him in a, in a certain category because he was a Christian. Mm -hmm. Is this categorization good or bad? And is it possible to be a serious artist and devout Christian and reach an audience of non-Christians? Well, in Lewis's time, I, it, that kind of criticism and the disdain that I was talking about before was partly due to his, that he was writing Christian works and, and was a, a Christian, but it was also because he was writing for a lay audience or a popular audience. That was the real division then, again, to go back to what I said before about the, that division between high culture and low culture. It's a little bit different today because not only do we have the division between, you know, the academic and the lay audiences, but we have this very big, and I say this as someone who's part of it, so I want to tread carefully here, but this very big sort of Christian publishing industry um, that creates a marketplace that is labeled and categorized as Christian. I mean, we see it in music as well. And so this is actually very much a later 20th and continuing to 21st century phenomenon of Christian you know, a Christian category of publishing and marketing and the near impossibility of crossing over to use that term. So I actually think that's a, you know, I, I wish it weren't that way, um, but it is that way. And so I think what we need to do is to just sort of to recognize it and, and perhaps, and to, to explain exploit it when it's good and purposeful to do so. So if I know I'm writing to a Christian audience, write to a Christian audience, but maybe keep some other people in mind. 
Um, and, uh, although I, 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 you know, that I have run into like, you know, I'm published by Christian publishers and once in a while, I, th there will be a review on Amazon from someone who clearly doesn't know who the publisher is and what this book is. And, and will say that, you know, that, that the book is a bunch of rot because it's written by one of those people who believe in God or something like that, you know, because they don't, you know, they, they got the wrong category, I guess. But so I think, I think it's a limitation, but given that it is, we just have to be intentional and try harder to, um, to cross those divides and to, uh, you know, every, it's not just everything is we're all divided into subcultures today. It's part of just being in this late modern age where marketing, everyone's micro marketed, even, you know, Facebook sends us the ads that conform to our demographics. Um, so there are, are opportunities there, but I think it's actually more something that we need to kind of um, perhaps try to um, overcome. <laughs> it's a lot to overcome. <laughs> Yeah. But this, uh, but the C.S. Lewis Institute is a, mm -hmm. is a good example of something that is, you know, is doing that. So, yes, yeah. thank you. We try. <laughs> um, Alexander has given us a little bit of a, an answer here about the um, solid people. Just oh. so you know, Alexander, thanks, Alexander. He says um, in the preface to the great divorce, that he got the idea of so the solid people from a science fiction story. He had forgotten what the name of the story was or the author. Oh. Um, but someone has done some research and found out that it was the man who lived backward by Charles F. Hall found in the tales of wonder published in the summer of 1938. Wow. Thanks Alexander. That is fabulous. <laughs> I think we should bring well, this that was before this poem. So that phrase must have also been that writer must have also been borrowing from because the poem, the poem, right, right, right. But I think in the poem, Lewis means, you know, like the, the more like solid, like just good people, good country, good country people, as Flannery O'Connor would call them. <laughs> yeah, I think we should bring this phrase back. Solid yeah. people. Yeah. Can I say, Karen, you're a solid person. Yes. I'm going to start that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lorraine has said that she's very pleased with, she loves your poetry choices, oh. but she, she misheard you. Did, did she hear you say that it was fortunate or unfortunate that his poetry was not well received? Oh, I think I said, I, I, I said, and maybe I, but maybe I didn't say it as carefully as she, I said it was in some, it was kind of fortunate, I think, because, oh, by the way, here's Eva, my dog. Oh. <laughs> she doesn't let me stay up here very long without in my zoom room um uh I was I think I said fortunate but I meant because because if because he turned to the I he found I think what his true calling and gift was and uh, even as a writer um and that was you know the fiction and the and the apologetics and um yeah <laughs> so yeah Karen, how has being a Christian influenced and shaped your own trajectory as a writer? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, I've been a Christian most of my life. I grew up in a Christian home, accepted Christ as a um, young girl. But when I went off to get my PhD um, and become a professor, I went, as you mentioned, to a state university. Mm -hmm. And I actually always imagined myself being you know, being a Christian, because I, I was, but being a Christian in a more secular setting, because I also grew up in the Northeast, which is very secular. Well, you know, you live in Manhattan, right? So I imagine myself um, kind of doing more academic work and being a more subtle sort of um, uh, covert Christian and witnessing to fellow academics. And so that was a completely different trajectory than I imagined, uh, when I, you know, began teaching at a Christian university and then doing the kind of writing I'm doing now, which is really for the church. Um, and it, so I, I just, that is what God has done. And it wasn't what I planned or imagined uh, or chose. But I do have to say that I am so grateful to be able to write um, in order to equip and elevate um, the church and to, to bring my love of literature to them, because I think the church deserves it and needs it more than the rest of the world. So, um, so it's, you know, that's just sort of in a nutshell, um, you know, I, 
imagined being a Christian taking me in a different direction, but this is the, the way that the Lord has made for me. And so I'm just very thankful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Denise has asked, how can we give Christ as the answer to a world that she literally, she says that disdains being able to know the answer. Mm-hmm. I think Denise is referring to the, you know, how do we, how do we give Christ as the answer to our world that doesn't accept right or wrong, or doesn't want to know answers mm-hmm. from questions? Yeah, that is such a good question because, um, because I think, you know, even just a few years ago, I would have seen it differently because I think that, um, I actually think that we might be shifting toward a world that does want answers, Mm -hmm. Um, like the rise of conspiracy theories and things like that, like that shows us that people want solutions and answers. But I think that what's happening is that we, um, that they, they don't know how to think through and to find evidence and weigh those things. So I think there's a way as Christians, we can uh, model what it means to, um, to reason and to think uh, and still have faith Um, because people, people do seem to be yearning that, but it's, I feel like we've, we're actually kind of entered a new dark age because we're in this post-literate culture. So people are reading a lot on the internet, but they don't know how to distinguish good sources from bad. And so, um, so I think that's what we need to, to model for them more is how to find the best answers. Um, and that also means being allowing them to ask their questions and modeling how to ask good questions too. There's so much I could say on this, and I <laughs> so I hope I'm beginning to answer it. Um, I, I love this good so, question. <laughs> I mean, I started reading on reading well, so I think maybe I'll just give your book a little plug here. So it was a little different than I expected it to be, in that you're talking through the chapters about different virtues mm-hmm. and how we can learn those virtues by reading. Um, different books. And I went straight to Jane Austen's Persuasion because I really enjoy that book. Um, So friends, if you're looking for a book to help you learn how to read, (laughs) this is a good one. Um, Karen, what, I mean, say there's someone in your life who is realizing they need answers uh, and they want to learn them from the good, the good, the solid people. Mm -hmm. What, what books would you send them to? Like, what are your top sort of five choices? Okay, so my top oh that my top five choices are uh, well you know and I oh it's so hard I like to know I, I like people to read something that they're interested in so I always like to find out more about the person but my personal top choices are um, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre um, uh, anything by Austin probably Pride and Prejudice is the best place to start although I have an edition of Sense and Sensibility that has an introduction for beginning re- you know for people who don't know how to read literature or even those who do and just you know wanted it's like a mini course for me in, in reading you know Austin um, and I am actually uh, just uh, finishing now reading for the first time and I am so in love with it John Steinbeck's East of Eden it's mm. amazing it's just amazing um and you know uh and for american literature anything by toni morrison i think she grapples with a lot of the questions that we're um struggling you know we're still kind of struggling with today Mm. Um, so those those would be you know and of course i have a bunch of different works that i talk about in on reading well and in booked literature in the soul of me so that's you know those are my mini courses (laughs) in reading literature (laughs) Karen, before I, we, we ask for a final comment, <clears throat> there's a great um, specific question here from Barbara. By the way, friends, your questions tonight have been wonderful, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to get to all of them. Um, hopefully, these are great things that you can talk about in your breakout groups tonight. But, um, well, Alexander has a quick question. Who wrote the introduction to Sense and Sensibility that you just mentioned, Karen? I did. Karen did. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> it's uh, published by B&H. So yeah. Perfect. And, and Barbara says, um, Academ- as an academic and pursuer of the intellectual life that entails lots of reading, writing, and research, Lewis seems to capture the sentiment of the too often alone in the last poem. Mm. He, uh, he is wanting to praise the humble mind of the solid people. And this is reminiscent of Ecclesiastes. And much learning is much sorrow. 
Many of us who teach and write experience the aloneness of sequestering ourselves for long periods of time with books and readings. But Lewis says he dreams of a fairy sea, but the dreams are mocking and beguiling him. Do you have any thoughts on this section of the poem? And she also loves on reading well. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, reading those, that poem um, right after reading the, um, the uh, French Nocturne, no, no, the, 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 his, his last one um, on the battlefield where he, where being, he wanted to be alone because he was surrounded by, you know, violent soldiers' faces. And then the other poem where being alone, he didn't want to be alone. Um, you know, I, I think that, I think that what Lewis kind of is getting at, even if, if it's implicit, is there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Um, and so even when, you know, when we're reading and writing, um, we're in converse with great minds. And then sometimes I think that the struggle is the reentry, going back <laughs> to the real people in our lives um, and communicating with them. And even social media, you know, there's a reason why introverts love social media so much because it's not the same. It's really not as demanding as being with the real people. Um, so I think there's, it's just that tension um, and writers feel it and artists feel it acutely, I think, because we do have to be alone at a lot. Um, and yet we still have to draw our inspiration and materials from real life, which includes real people. So um, I, I just, I, I love that. And, and if, if I were rereading this collection one more time, that I think I would look for that, that theme there and then the way he handles it differently. It didn't really come out until this talk tonight for me. So thanks for that great question. Wonderful. Karen, this has been fabulous. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And I've really enjoyed speaking with you this evening. Uh, do you have any final comments, words, uh, perhaps a benediction for us to send us on our way tonight? Yeah, well, I guess so. My final words, um, I was, as I was thinking through the, you know, the great questions and answers and, you know, the discussion tonight, it occurred to me that, you know, sometimes we approach someone like Lewis in, in awe and admiration because he's this great writer, but, and he is, but we all, you know, especially if we are believers, then we are leaving a record like Lewis is leaving. We may not be having, you know, these, these kinds of books published, or maybe we are, but we are reading, leaving a legacy, whether it's, you know, on social media and our Twitter feed or our Facebook or, you know, in any, any place we're, we're inundated with print um, and we are, we are re leaving a record and we need to think about when people come go back and read what we've written or our interactions, um, what kind of legacy we leave. Are they seeing us growing toward, you know, we all make mistakes and have weak moments of weakness, um, but are we growing toward belief and mature belief um, like Lewis did? Um, and I think we all can. And so I guess my benediction would be, may you grow and mature in your belief and leave a record of that for the world to witness. Thank you, Karen. That's yeah. something I need to think about a lot. Okay. I appreciate that. Friends, I'm going to uh, pray for us, uh, but before I do, I want to remind you that those of you who are signed up to be in our breakout discussion groups tonight, um, after we close here, you'll need to go back to your email, look for an email from Stephen, which gives you the link to our discussion groups. There'll be a little bit of a break so you can have a breather and get some water. We'll start them in about 10 minutes. And we look forward to seeing you there and discussing more in depth uh, some of what Karen has brought up tonight and including some of the things that are still on your minds. I'd like to thank again, our sponsors, Preservation of Elegance, Dr. and Mrs. G. Wesley Vick III, Kevin and Marianne Dibley and Joshua George. Thank you so much for providing uh, for us a wonderful, wonderful evening of encouragement and learning this evening. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that you give us a mind and that you encourage us to use it. Would you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, point us towards using our mind and using our words as a legacy which brings you honor and glory? 
May the words that we write, the words that we speak, the words that we sing, the ways that we speak to one another, the ways that we encourage and admonish one another, may they over our lifetime show that we are becoming more like you, molded into your glory. Lord, we look forward to being together truly again in the future. And as we go, would you grant us the peace of mind and the peace of spirit, which comes from having met with our family in Christ and with you. In your name we pray. Amen.